This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 472, recorded on December 15th, 2017. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. Where it is really cold. And cloudy. Yeah. It's not very and it's nice. supposed to snow on the weekend. Minus two Celsius. It says, yep. here, it says we're having snow showers. That's Do you see correct. any showering snow? Uh, not, uh, not at the moment, but I'm sure that somewhere on that horizon there is. There is. This is the weather that hurts. It's painful. <laughs> Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you doing? We're all well. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to look up the weather. It's uh, 56 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is, Celsius, and cloudy. Well, there's some sun shining through the clouds. We're kind of into what passes for a winter in uh, Austin, <laughs> Texas. Right. <laughs> it's all good. From southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kathy. Here, it's 24 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 4 Celsius, and pretty gray sky with some snowflakes coming down now and then. Right. Mm. Yeah, we're in the minuses. We are. And from western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Yeah, good to be here. And it is cold and overcast here, 23 Fahrenheit, minus 5C. It got down to, um, I think it got to the single digits last night. Mm. Fahrenheit. Wow. That's cool. the last of the roses. <laughs> Supposed to get to 17 tonight and then 12 Saturday nights. So. Nice. Lovely. You picked living there, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, kind of. <clears throat> All right. We're, we're coming to the end of 2017, aren't we? We are. We are. Just, we are. just uh, two weeks left. And uh, I guess we'll have to do our year in review at one of these days can do it either on the 29th or the 5th of January. Well, we'll I won't be with you on the 29th. That doesn't prevent you from doing it. But oh, that's, that's Will you be with us on the 5th? Yep. Let's do it on the 5th then. Sure. I will be 65 years old a few mm. days earlier. Wow. I have to register for Medicare yes. Part, which A is it? A. a. B. Yeah. B? Is it A? Now, would you oh, better yeah. take a. out a B a. from somebody else? Otherwise, you won't be able to cover your... The years is moving on. Affleck. Pretty Affleck. soon, I'll be pushing up daisies. No. Nah. Staring at the stars is the way we put it. I've lived got, longer than got, I'm going to live. Let's put it that way. Oh. You got 95 years in you. Yeah. What was the George George Burns quote? If I'd have known I was going to live this long, I would have no. taken better care of myself. <laughs> no, that, no, that wasn't George Burns. That was not George Burns. It okay. was the guy, the ragtime piano player. Scott uh, Joplin. Uh, yeah. Really? He said no. that? Yeah. Mm. No, no, no. Not Scott Joplin. It was somebody else that played Scott Joplin. He was terrific. Oh, I know who you mean. Um, oh, I almost had his name. I'll get it sometime in the middle Sorry, of the show. Sorry, it was before my time. <laughs> All right, I want to uh, just make a brief announcement. <coughs> Michael Douglas's father, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Michael Douglas's father just turned 101, so mm. that could hurt. Wow. Kirk Douglas. Fahrenheit? Well, Fahrenheit, that's right. <laughs> He's got a slight temperature. <laughs> I want to make a, a few comments about Patreon. Now, in the past couple of weeks, Patreon has made a big f uh, mistake. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> they decided. They would charge patrons. The patrons are the people who give us money, our listeners. They donate on a monthly basis. So Patreon decided they would change their policy and charge uh, a fee of patrons. And so if you gave a dollar, you'd basically be giving 30 cents of that to, or maybe 30 additional cents to Patreon. A lot of uh, outca outcry over that. And they basically reversed their policy and said, we're sorry, we screwed up. But the downside is a lot of people left because they got pissed off. So we actually lost a good percentage of our patrons. So I just want to tell everyone, if you're listening and you were a patron, you can go back because you won't get charged. Or you can just go to PayPal. You go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There's a PayPal button there. If you go there, you go to PayPal. It says how much do you want to contribute. And then there's a little box that says make this a monthly repeating amount. You could go directly through PayPal if you want and bypass Patreon. That's an Elon Musk invention, by the way, in case everybody didn't know that. 
And so come back. We could use your support so that we can travel and do things on the road and so forth. And uh, we have no more ad support, if you noticed. Um, we did notice. That. Um, so the, the last few ads we've done for Sinai, Mayo Clinic, the Department of Defense, they all came to me, which is good. Nice. I cannot, I cannot go and find advertisers, but I don't have the time to do that. Right. But we did have a contract with an ad agency for the previous two years, and they got ads for us, and we paid for that. But they told me a, a month ago that we were too small for them, that they, they only want shows with 50,000 downloads per episode in the first week after the show is released. <laughs> oh, so wow. they're, they're going for the top 1% of all podcasts. Well, you can't blame them for and that. That's fine. And so the rich continue getting richer. Yep. <laughs> so, um, you know, if people come to us, we'll take them. But in the meanwhile, we're dependent on your donations. So... Uh, Check it out. We we have a good number of people out there donating, which is great. But you know, if I I always say if everyone gave a buck a month, this is nothing. A buck a month is twelve bucks a year. Exactly. We would have an, a good amount of money, and I could actually hire someone to help out, which would be great. Exactly. Because this week, this week I did five podcasts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't had a chance wow. to post them yet because I have other things to do and so forth. Yeah. Um, well, if you get more money, I want my salary doubled. Okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. No problem. No problem. I want more health benefits. <laughs> and oh, the other, the last thing I want to say is next year I'm going to turn. So right now your contributions go to an LLC called Microbe TV LLC. Mm. Now I want to make it into a nonprofit next year, so your your donations will be tax deductible. And a number of people have told me they would oh. make substantial donations if it were a nonprofit. So five hundred one c three maybe or eight hundred nine seventy two forty four hike. Your or sir, mine. <laughs> yeah, what is it? Five hundred one three C. Five hundred one C three. I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work on making it a nonprofit, and maybe that'll help. And we maybe we could go to donors and say, you know, we're doing a good thing for science communication. Would you like to contribute? Right. You bet. Um, you have to start off by saying, "Dude, <laughs> dude, dude, <laughs> dude, they dude." Right. <laughs> That's right. Hathi, you have anything to say about ASV? Sure. It's coming up that. Uh, I'm going to be really pushing hard for people to submit their abstracts. That would be the February 1st deadline. But in the meantime, it now is a really good time to renew your membership or to join ASV. If you're a student or postdoc and you want to apply for travel awards, the deadline for that will be February 1st, and you need to be a member in order to submit those travel award applications. And... If you're going to submit an abstract, you have to have a sponsor who's a dues-paid member. We changed the whole dues structure. You can pay your dues online. You can opt to have your future dues mailings be electronic uh, and go paperless. And if you haven't created your ASV profile as a member online, uh, that means you've probably already gotten three reminders and the latest token will expire December 31st. So do yourself a favor Get on, go online, create your profile, renew your dues, and you'll be all set to submit your abstract. There you go. Nice. Cool. And one final thing here. Uh, on Instagram uh, the other day, so Linda Coughlin, who was here on TWIV, young lady from Ireland, remember Dixon? Who could forget? Um, she was delightful. So she is um, on Instagram as virus nerdette. And she posted a picture from the Mount Sinai holiday party of cookies with viruses and Petri dishes on them. Nice. And one that says it's not easy, <laughs> which is probably <clears throat> con considering our discussions lately. <laughs> yeah. I understand that one. <laughs> so I saw this on Twitter and then I followed the links and found that there was uh, another one that had more of the virus mm. cookies, so I'm about to insert that uh, into the link. But the uh, Twitter thing for the picture that you put in the show notes said uh, there was a blank cookie that was Sinombri virus. <laughs> oh, that's good. Blank. Good. Very good. I think I saw Jennifer Hamilton on that. How many that. viruses? Yes, that's where I found it. How many viruses can you catch by the oral route? <sighs> Depends how big your mouth is. Dixon. No, no, no. Like Mimi viruses wouldn't fit in your mouth, I know, but it wouldn't mind. Right. But, but I seriously, I, I can't give you a number because <clears throat> those would have been the right you, ones. You want to know? On the you want to know what kinds of? Well, polio, right? That Put would be a good one. All the enteroviruses, enteros, some right. adenos too, no. right? 
sure. uh, noroviruses, re- rotaviruses. Rota. Uh, some of the coronas. Yeah. coronas. See, did, I tell you last, see. did I tell you last week yeah. that my grandson had hand, foot, and mouth disease? Really? No. Oh. Yeah, mine first, did, so did mine. First time I've seen it, it was cool. Mine had it too. You're the only parent or grandparent that would say that about a viral <laughs> rash causing <laughs> disease. Cool. No, it's cool. Not only that, but my daughter says, you got to come over. I know you're going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to oh, love dear, this. Dear, dear, dear. All right. Um, so that is... I, I particularly like Instagram. Photos are great. You know, a picture is worth a, My bil- a eyes billion just words. just glossed over. That's fine. You know, not, not for you. Don't know what an Instagram is. So I'm on Instagram, P R O F V R R, and Virus Nerdette. I just posted a picture, Dixon, of a bat in the subway of New York City. A bat? A bat. A baseball bat or no, a flying no, bat? a flying bat. It's on the wall underneath the Museum of Natural no. History. Oh. <laughs> it was a very pretty mosaics on the oh, wall there, and it was a bat, sense. and I thought of viruses. <laughs> so, I, I, I tend, Nipa. Nipa. so I tend to post virusy pictures. Yeah, well, I don't know why, but... We have some follow-ups. <laughs> First one is from Ben Padman. This was posted on the website. On episode 470, so I, I didn't see it right of way. Mm-hmm. And, and Ben is one of the authors on the paper we discussed in Twift 470 <clears throat> about bacteriophages passing through epithelial right. cell. Yeah. Remember, uh, he writes, Hi there, I heard your questions about CLEM, correlative light electron microscopy, from the transcytosis paper. I wanted to clear up a few things. One, I acquired the optical and electron images a week apart using two different microscopes, a Leica SP8 scanning confocal and a Hitachi H7500 transmission EM. Two, I used a modified version of my previously published protocol, and he provides a link. Three, Kathy had it right. The subcellular locations were relocated after ultra-thin sectioning of the resin-embedded sample. Mm. Four, when I started the experiment, I was really surprised by how many phages there were inside the cells, yet none of them seemed to correlate directly with the optical data. (laughs) That's when we realized that cyber, the dye, was pH sensitive. This is a problem because endosomes are slightly acidic, about six for early endosomes, five for late endosomes. The phages were leaking cyber almost immediately after entering the cells. Hindsight is a cruel mistress should have used a pH-resistant dye. I think that's a good title. The phages were leaking cyber. <laughs> or hindsight is a cruel mistress. I like that one. <laughs> or master. <clears throat> well, yes. Look at those cookies. They just went in uh, the yeah, go notes. One, one of them looks to me like it is indeed a plaque. It is, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> or at least could be. It is. Oh, there's a neat. What, now, look, there's one there at the bottom of a cup. What's that? Those are just the sprinkles. The, just sprinkles. Those are just the sprinkles. Yeah. Maybe they were meant to be something, but yeah, there's, there's someone, no caption. Someone brought it in and said, I didn't have time to bake anything. Here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the control. That is the control. It's the Linux yeah, maybe version it, of a cookie. You put it together yourself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe it's just a bunch of um, VSVs or something. Who knows? Could be. Vincent, what? just what? do me a favor and turn around and look out the window. The snow has arrived. It's a snow shower. The snow has arrived. It's coming down like crazy actually snow it's not actually a shower yeah that's what i said actually all right you want to keep going back and forth no all right <laughs> i'm done all right uh alan can you take the next one please <clears throat> sure aaron writes dear twiv first of all thank you for such an enlightening podcast i only recently came across twiv but have greatly enjoyed the last few episodes as a bioengineer whose work occasionally intersects with immunity being able to hear about virology from a community i wouldn't otherwise be involved with has been enormously educational I felt compelled to write in about your response to a recent letter from Brandon in Fresno, California, as I found your description of LGBT life experiences in academia at Rockefeller was problematic. There is nothing that needs to be, quote, done about a colleague who is gay. Additionally, mentioning that an LGBT individual is, quote, not a predator only serves to promote a dangerous and inaccurate notion that gay people are more likely to be so. Uh, to answer Brandon's question, I can only describe my own experience, but as a gay man who's been out during my undergraduate studies through becoming a professor, I have only found the scientific communities I've been a part of to be entirely welcoming and inviting. Whichever program you end up joining, I would encourage you to seek out mentors who are able to provide guidance about supportive labs, graduate, and scientific communities. Many campuses maintain an LGBT campus resource center, and organizations such as OSTEM have a wealth of resources and contacts. 
Best of luck with your applications. And thanks again for Twiv. Uh, uh, thanks again, Twiv, for a wonderful podcast. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the comments he's calling out were Dixon's, which I they took were. as a. I, I took that as a as a historical perspective. That's correct. This, That's so, exactly this how it was meant. These are conversations that happened a very, very long time ago in a very different era. Yep. Um, that is right. And and I, I don't think you you didn't mean those as endorsing those views. Not it was at all. Just, this is how this is how that was expressed. Exactly. And in fact, the the faculty at Rockefeller did eventually adjust to that situation quite nicely. So he right. he never felt ostracized. By the way, once they'd gotten past their initial, it was a shock though because one day. He came in, he was dressed differently and his whole demeanor right. was different and uh, he he was being dramatic about it and it was uh, a shock. Yeah, but they got over it. Good. I just want to mention that um, my, my phone tells me when people like my Instagram posts <laughs> and there's a, there's a follower called Hemosexual. <laughs> Hemo, H-A-E-M-O. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's relevant to the that's letter. either very creative or slightly scary. I'm not going to go there, but I can say he's not my type, but that's that's another issue. I get it. That's a joke. <laughs> yes. yes. I'm, I'm sorry, but that was a joke. Are you an O? I could be. A universal donor? <laughs> mm. Kathy, can you take the next one? Uh, We're on Arthur. 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 Yeah. Hi, y'all. Did we ever decide on a gender neutral pronoun? <laughs> Question mark, exclamation point. I'm a DPhil student working on oncolytic adenoviruses in Oxford, UK. Just a very quick note to say that I can thoroughly agree with the comments on being openly gay in science. Universities tend to swing more towards liberal because of the demographic, and most universities have an incredibly strong and active LGBTQI plus society that you can easily search for online. I've worked in a few labs, and I've been lucky to receive no discrimination with my PIs, often meeting my husband at work parties, etc., This isn't to say that living in university cities that are liberal doesn't include experiencing the homophobia, microaggressions, and violence that are, unfortunately, still a part of being an openly queer person. I've collaborated with colleagues who are gay from more conservative, aka religious, countries, such as Malaysia and Mm. RAE... Royal Emirates. It's Arab Arab Emirates. 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 Ah, yes. Okay. Isn't that UAE? Uh, R-A-E, that's true. Uh, R-A-E is what country? Let's see what it says. <laughs> I got a country singer called Delta Ray. Yep, that's, I got that mm-hmm. one too. Right. Yeah. No, I don't know. Type well, that all capitals. Maybe it was a mistake. Anyway, he's collaborated with colleagues from who are gay from more conservative countries, such as Malaysia and this other one, who live openly when they are here in the UK, but due to laws, cannot live openly in their home countries at work or at home. So we still have some way to go. In more liberal countries, however, I have a great many colleagues who are openly queer without fearing it will affect their careers. So please don't let that put anyone off. Thanks so much for all you do as a team. There's a ton of work that goes into these podcasts, and it truly pays off. Thanks, Arthur. Mm -hmm. Got to read the and P.S. 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 Oh, sorry. It's on the next page. P.S. I have a very <laughs> embarrassing story about meeting a Twiver at a conference. I was at the International Adenovirus Conference and started talking to a very friendly person and, who sat next to me. And as usual, I started my sales pitch on how fantastic Twiv is, only to have the person sitting next to me say, I actually am a contributor to that podcast. I'm Kathy Spindler. <laughs> and I promptly turned the color of borscht. <laughs> <laughs> with a T. <laughs> yeah, with a T. Nice. Very good. I do remember this now, Arthur. <laughs> yes. A nice callback to borscht. <laughs> but yeah, yes. we got two arcs here. That's very funny. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, Rich, you're next. Andrew writes, Dear Twiv team, I'm a big fan of your podcast. You heard from me on Twiv 185 when I was working on my PhD and MD at Northwestern. The episode cover photo is actually me sitting in a fort built of plaque assays, <laughs> HSV, not polio. After finishing my MD and PhD at Northwestern, I completed an uh, internal residency, uh, internal medicine residency at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and am now a first year infectious disease fellow at Hopkins. Uh, I am giving ID Journal Club uh, next week on this paper. Sorry, it's behind a paywall. Uh, and which paper is that? ADE in dengue. Ah, uh, uh, ADE people. in dengue. Right. Um, uh, I came across while listening to Mark. Chris Lips, PUSCast. In it, the authors describe antibody-dependent enhancement, 
ADE of secondary dengue infections in humans. My understanding is that previously this had only been worked out in animal models. I thought this was very relevant to the discussion last week's TWIV episode and helps explain why the Sanofi vaccine data are problematic. Thank you for pointing me in the direction of the Halstead article, which will certainly add to the discussion at the Journal Club. We're lucky to have Anna Durbin mentioned in last week's podcast in reference to TWIV 384 on faculty at Hopkins. Uh, so I'm excited to hear what she has to say about these papers. Currently, 27 Fahrenheit minus 3C in Maryland. Keep up the great work. All the best, Andrew. Andrew is, as he said, an ID fellow at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and the paper is from Eva Harris's lab in Berkeley, which uses epidemiologic data to um, elaborate on uh, ADE in the human population. I think we should do this paper. It just came out in November, yeah. and um, it, it passed my desk, as they say, and I, it's in my it's in my um, sites. Yeah, that'd be TWIV, good. It's a TWIV paper. It's good to hear where former people on TWIV end up. I'd forgotten Andrew at. He uh, he inspired me to build the wall of polio. I saw this little fork he had of plaque assay plates, and uh, he, you know his was temporary. It was a short thing that he was sitting in in the lab in that in that episode. You can go and see. Cool. I hate to say this, Vincent, but we are all temporary. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? It means that ashes to ashes. Well, I know that, but what does that have to do with what I'm saying? Because <laughs> you said his was temporary. Am I just? temporary <laughs> well that's temporary too yeah but a longer temporary than less his. temporary <laughs> that's right it's ex-temporary well his, his was was built in his little area where All his right, chair and desk were so right. he had to take it down to to get out actually oh, oh i see <laughs> so it's really temporary An enclave as it were. <laughs> yes all right that sure. is our um follow-up and now we have a snippet we return to snippets because we'll see how we do on this. We uh, yeah, yeah, we really need to do a snippet, but I got an email this week from Rich Condit. He says, do we do snippets anymore? <laughs> and so, yeah, why not? <laughs> Go ahead, Rich. Tell us about this. All right. Uh, let's hope we can make this a snippet. This is a paper from the uh, Bernard Moss Lab at NIH. First uh, author is Andrea Weisberg. Uh, other authors are uh, Maruri Avidal. Bisht, Hansen, Schwartz, Fisher, Meng, Zhang, and of course, Bernie Moss. And it's entitled The Enigmatic Origin of the Pox Virus Membrane from the Endoplasmic Reticulum, shown by 3D imaging of Vaccinia virus assembly mutants. So let me see if I can uh, do some background to this. So Vaccinia virus is a pox virus. We've talked about them extensively on TWIV. Uh, and the part of the magic of pox viruses is that they are large DNA-containing viruses that replicate exclusively in the cytoplasm of infected cells and so have to encode all sorts of things that are ordinarily copped from the nucleus um, to get through their life cycle. And, uh, and, uh, and they are enveloped. Uh, relevant to this paper, um, uh, it, during the replication cycle, they establish uh, large cytoplasmic factories. Um, and these are uh, uh, a large, I think, structural and obviously functional component of these is DNA. The size and number of the factories is proportional to DNA replication. But uh, within those factories, there's lots of activity, including DNA replication and transcription. Uh, and all the virus assembly goes on in there. Um, the assembly process is fascinating. Uh, and it starts uh, with uh, the fabrication of these membranes that seem to come out of nowhere in two dimensions in transmission electron microscopy, they look like crescents. And uh, you have to imagine that in three dimensions, those would be like cupules. <laughs> uh, and then they uh, get, uh, they seem to, I mean, you can't take a time lapse of this, but the idea is that they grow ultimately to look like uh, circles in two dimensions, which would be spheres, and are filled with an electron-dense uh, matter, relatively dense. And then magic happens, and there is a gross rearrangement 
of the internal contents of these to give you a lot of substructure on the inside, a core particle and on all of this kind of stuff. And they change shape from a sphere to a kind of a flattened barrel. Uh, and on the very exterior, and that's the mature particle, on the very exterior of that is the membrane that was being fabricated in the initial stages. Now, the virus, that's only one of two types of virus particle. It can acquire a second membrane on its way out of the cell, and we're not going to talk about that. We're just going to talk about this initial membrane. So the the mystery, one of the big mysteries here is where does this, where do these bits of membrane come from that this thing gets made out of, right? Exactly. And so that's I what's enigmatic point, in the title. Yes, and and I should I should um, point out that I, uh, that this for me, uh, we're not going to cure any huge health problems here. Uh, I don't think not in the immediate future. This is for me an issue of raw curiosity. Okay. This is just, uh, a topic that has been an enigma since 1961 when there were the first detailed visualizations of this whole, uh, morphogenesis process by, uh, Siminovich and Dales. Uh, and they were the first to describe these crescents evolving into, uh, these spheres, um, which by the way are called IV or, uh, immature virus particles. Okay. And they use the word de novo to describe these as if the membranes uh, arose out of nowhere, which in, in itself was a bit of a problematic description because people started to think that the virus itself might even make enzymes that fabricated membranes. And that's definitely not the case. But what, what they really intended, I think, and what's magic or en enigmatic about this, as Alan said, is that the dogma is that membranes are all derived from other pre-existing membranes. And to have a membrane appear, uh, in particular, a single bilayer, appear uh, without any apparent connection to any other uh, cellular membrane system uh, was a, a significant novelty. And the question is always, what's, how does this happen? What's going on? So over the – and this – particular paper addresses that problem and it brings a lot of stuff together with some some new data that I think really goes a long way towards solving this problem but also as we'll see leaves a, a couple of questions open um, uh, so evidence has been accumulating that these factories are shot through with endoplasmic reticulum endoplasmic reticulum is an uh, an extensive intracellular membrane system that derives initially from the nuclear envelope uh, and ultimately into rough ER and other membrane uh, uh, systems. Uh, and uh, this is smooth ER, that is, without ribosomes, that uh, seems to, although I don't can't think of many studies that directly address this, it's fairly obvious that the ER penetrates these factories. And I've seen some pictures, actually taken some pictures from my own lab, under special circumstances where you can see a lot of membrane in the factories. And recent experiments from the Moss lab and others uh, have shown that this is actually ER and has um, uh, revealed that there does seem to be perhaps some continuity between ER uh, and these crescents, but it's really hard to uh, nail down. And uh, it's mostly and it's mostly by transmission electron microscopy. Yes, so yes. far. Uh, and I should also point out that there are a couple of key players in this whole thing. There's two major uh, vaccinia uh, membrane proteins called eight. These the names are really dry. Sorry, but they have meaning to me. A17 and A14. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that gives structure to these membranes. Those are both integral membrane proteins. The one that uh, seems to be the most important of those is uh, A17, and I'll just call it the membrane protein. And then there's a protein called D13, which I will call the scaffold protein, uh, that can attach to A17 on the outside of these uh, crescents. And uh, get, although A17 gives the membrane some curvature by itself, uh, D13 is almost like, a, and structurally it's very uh, reminiscent of a real capsid protein uh, and uh, assembles in this uh, lattice of uh, trimers 
on the uh, outside of these crescents and gives rigidity and shape and uh, thickness uh, to these crescents. So the membrane, a membrane protein A17 and the scaffold protein D13 are players in this. Now, one of the things that the Moss Lab has done over the past few years is to study a variety of mutants that uh, they have dubbed collectively uh, VMAP uh, proteins, standing for viral membrane assembly proteins. Okay? There's five of these that they've identified primarily by genetics, and any one of them, if they are uh, mutated, uh, cause an aberration in the assembly where you can see by transmission electron microscopy, you accumulate uh, crescents uh, and spheres or circles uh, in two dimensions that are devoid of the, the goo, the electron-dense goo that is to become the core and that kind of stuff. So they call them IVLs or um, immature virus-like particles. Uh, and interestingly, those things often seem to appear uh, uh, inside other membrane compartments. It's as if they're in, inside sacs or something like that. Uh, and so that's a uh, clue uh, that these mutants could be used to further elucidate the origin of these IVLs, which they do in this paper. Uh, and the big deal about this paper is they do this with um, electron uh, tomography, which I think we have described before, but I'll do it briefly. You take a fairly thick, thick section. Uh, that's a relatively thick section relative to electron microscopy. Um, and uh, uh, take uh, EM pictures of it where you uh, tilt the stage through uh uh, almost 180 degrees uh, and take a number of images uh, and then use computer software to assemble that into a three-dimensional image of that um, uh, uh, section. Um, and uh, they do this with all of these mutants. And what the, the bottom line is what they discover uh, is that these IVLs, are derived by budding into the interior of an expanded uh, endoplasmic reticulum. So these endoplasmic reticulum is usually thought of as uh, existing as cisterni, so two uh, membrane bilayers that are very close to each other and closed. So there'll be an inside and an outside. The inside would be called the lumen. And these are expanded... Uh, probably in the process of making these IVLs, so that those two bilayers are no longer all that close to each other. Now we have a big sac. And what appears to happen is that you get budding inward from the outside via the addition of the virus membrane protein uh, and uh, also the uh, scaffold protein, which must leak into the inside, uh, to form these invaginations and ultimately these... Uh, uh, spherical uh, IVLs or um, immature virus-like uh, particles. So the bottom line is that this is visual evidence that these things are, in fact, derived from ER. And uh, one of the cool things is the coolest things is the pictures themselves. Now this paper is behind a paywall, but but the supplementary data are not. Exactly. And the supplementary data uh, are what's really cool. So I yes. would encourage you, if you have any interest in this, uh, to go to the link, and maybe we could even put the link to the supplementary data uh, by itself uh, in the show notes, and click on these movies. Because the movies are great. They, they, and this is pretty typical of this kind of technology now, they show uh, the, the two-dimensional picture uh, and then they show uh, how uh, all the pictures look in the rotation, and then they progressively show how that is interpreted into a uh, colored picture of what these look like. And you can see the uh, connections with the viral membranes and the ER. Uh, and lastly, they also uh, use a some technology that I won't go into in detail to show that if you express the membrane protein and the scaffold protein uh, essentially by themselves in the cytoplasm of cells, you can get structures that look like this. 
uh, reinforcing the idea that it is these viral proteins, the membrane protein and the scaffold protein, uh, that do this trick with the uh, ER to generate these membranes. And they have a nice uh, cartoon at the end um, that shows their model of what happens, uh, which is that you start out with an ER cisterna, uh, and uh, the membrane protein becomes embedded in that, and the uh, VMAPs, the viral membrane um, assembly proteins, uh, are, according to their model, under normal circumstances, responsible for cutting up that membrane, that ER that has uh, the membrane protein, the viral membrane protein embedded in it, which then becomes coated with uh, D13 and would have VMAPs uh, that are associated with the ends to stabilize the ends of these now membrane segments, which otherwise would be unstable. And they have evidence uh, from previous studies to um, – support the notion that there is association between VMAPs and the end of these. Uh, then eventually, the, these aggregate with the core proteins and make immature particles. Uh, and in the case of the VMAPs, you just don't get this cleavage. And so instead of making these crescent segments, you get this budding into the expanded ER. And that uh, allows you to visualize the connections between the viral membranes and the endoplasmic reticulum, which otherwise can't be visualized. You see these crescents. Hmm. Now, cool. actually, I um, uh, it's on the paper, so I'm not revealing anything. I actually reviewed this. They they because I, I think if you are an academy member, uh, maybe you are compelled to review uh, reveal the reviewers. I don't know, uh, but at any rate, uh, it states in, up on the top who the reviewers were, and it was only in looking over this for the show that I realized that I should have asked Bernie a question. OK, <laughs> uh, in the review, which is he proposed they propose that they get these uh, membrane, these crescents, these segments. Um, and then those evolve into these spheres. Uh, but they don't say anything directly in the paper about how those segments evolve into the spheres. OK, so I, I wrote Bernie and I said I wrote him last night. I said, like, do they grow? Are the segments <laughs> Uh, actually connected to ER and we can't see it or what? Uh, and he wrote back saying that they think that what happens is that before the D13 is ag uh, added, when you have segments of ER that have A17 in them, um, that those can fuse. And I, I would assume fuse actually with uh, uh, membrane crescents that are already associating with material. Um, and he has the, he does talk in the paper about how there is evidence for both scission and fusion of ER membranes uh, in its metabolism in the cell. Uh, so basically, they're thinking, and I think this has yet uh, to be proven, uh, that these uh, segments that are generated in the in the process of the evolution of the membrane can actually fuse to, uh, if you like, grow the crescents uh, into the circles or spheres to give you. Uh, the final product. So that's it. Um, this has been a long-standing mystery from de novo uh, membrane uh, formation that has uh, been a dominant uh, mystery in the field for a long time. There's a lot of work over a long period of time here to come to this point, uh, but it's this is a nice coalescence of all that, in particular with these nice uh, tomograms, which you yourself can view, and I encourage you to uh, go have a look at them. They're fascinating. Yeah. One other thing that seemed to facilitate this, and you may have already said this, but just since I think we're recapping here, is the fact that they use these mutants that slowed down the assembly process. And that may have been what allowed to, them to capture images of the connection between the ER and the, and the viral crescents. Uh, yes. In fact, uh, that, that's, that's uh, essential, is that all of these pictures are from, there's a couple of control wild-type infections, but all of the tomograms are from these, uh, from these uh, mutants. So, and the, the mutants, uh, when they, the, the mutants prevent 
the segmentation of the ER. So that's what allows you to see the continuity between the, uh, the evolving crescents and the endoplasmic reticulum. In the absence of the mutants in a wild-type uh, infection, the segmentation of the ER, according to their model, happens so early on that you can't see the continuity with the endoplasmic reticulum. Right. So these mutants let them pause it so that they can actually get yeah. these images. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you think that this origin of the membrane from the ER would be the case for all pox viridae? Yes, I would think so. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, I would have to go do some study, uh, but I would say that something similar to this is going to extend to other large nucleocytoplasmic, mm -hmm. whatever the acronym is, viruses. Um, because uh, African swine fever, um, and uh, Mimi virus and Mama virus and all those guys uh, have membranes. And I think uh, I can't uh, claim to be uh, uh, really an expert on this. I would have to do some uh, study of these. But my guess is that this extends to many of those as well. Well, next time you're in Starbucks, you could just do that, you know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> or I could go back to the lab. You could do that, too. It sounds to me like you haven't left it, Rich. Well, in my You're head, no. I must pretty, say it's a lot e current. it's a lot easier reading papers and talking about it than it is doing it. Yeah. I think of that frequently. <laughs> so as I'm doing smooth, it. Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah. Smooth. All of the all of the all of the labor involved uh yeah. to to do this. And you really have to be uh young and full of juice to make this happen. Uh and so rough, uh, smooth ER and rough ER, the difference, of course, is that one is coated with ribosomes and the other mm -hmm. isn't. Now, are there binding sites along the smooth ER to allow the ribosomes to line up? Uh, that I can't answer for you. I do know that the way that ribosomes attach to ER is through the signal peptide that's made from a membrane protein. But how those might be directed to appropriate sites in the ER, uh, I don't know. My guess is that it is known. So I just wondered if they're functional for the virus in some way, rather than binding ribosomes, would they bind something else inside the virus? I see. I see. Uh, you know, it's interesting. The um, <clears throat> So just as you that. may know, uh, 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 transmembrane proteins uh, can have specific sequences in them that direct uh, the protein to different uh, membrane components, mm -hmm. you know, ER or Golgi right. or wherever they can have different signals. Yeah. It turns out that in the context of a vaccinia infection, uh, transmembrane, anything that contains a transmembrane domain and does not contain some other signal by default goes into ER. And my guess is it's because it's there. <laughs> right. Uh, and you have to very deliberately, yeah. uh, and there are some vaccinia proteins that do go to other membrane compartments. They have to have specific signals to uh, uh, direct them elsewhere. But anything with just a transmembrane domain by default goes into ER. Mm -hmm. I would love to see some sort of 3D picture of a factory which specifically illuminates the endoplasmic reticulum inside the factory. Uh, in three dimensions, go for it, Bernie, because, uh, uh, uh my, uh, I, I think, I think the factories are probably just loaded with ER. It's all over the place. So what's directing the increased synthesis then of the ER then? I don't know that there is necessarily increased synthesis. Or is there, there just subunits sitting around waiting to assemble? I, my, uh, you know, actually, you know, there are some studies that, uh, suggest that, uh, the, DNA replication at the early stages is uh, specifically associated with ER. And there are some pictures from a couple of labs uh, to um, uh, support that idea. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm not 100% on board with that uh, as a, you know, a deliberate uh, thing. But it does have precedent in uh, other systems, in coli, uh, DNA replication is membrane associated. Um, so that's not, uh, an out of the question thing, okay. but my guess is that, the uh, uh, there's as part of factory, uh, evolution, there is a, if you like, 
in quotes, deliberate incorporation of ER uh, for this purpose. Uh, there have been some studies that look at lipid uh, metabolism and whether it increases during the infection. Frankly, I forget the uh, results of those, but I don't think it's necessarily the case that you need to elaborate a whole lot more uh, endoplasmic reticulum in order to do this. And which cells are permissive, just as a general? Uh, just all kinds, That's what especially for vaccinia. Yeah. It's very, very broad right. host range. All right, our paper... <laughs> is on an RNA virus. It's also a PNAS paper. Just came out. And I believe it's our first lizard virus. Hmm. Although, whether you know, the, the, we're not talking about infecting lizards today, these are many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. But the title of this is An Endogenous Retroviral Envelope. Syncytion and its cognate receptor identified in the viviparous placental mabuya lizard. And the. Um, I've been telling everybody about this paper. <laughs> this is, this <laughs> it's so cool. Did you tell your granddaughter with the rash? I, I have not yet told her. <laughs> and I have not yet told Porter. I'll make a point of telling them when I next see them. But right. I told my wife and I told my daughter at Starbucks today. The uh, first two authors. Co-first authors, Guillaume Cornelis and Mathis Funk. And then we have Vershonne Lille, Tarazona, Maurice Heidman, Dupressoir, Miral, Ramirez Pinilla, and Heidman. That senior author is Thierry Heidman. There we are two the third and person's two name. What? I can't, I don't know what you said. What did you say? Sorry. I said repronounce the third person's name. I think you got it wrong. Vernoche? That's better. Yes. What did I say? Vernochet. Oh, that was totally wrong. Yeah, <laughs> Vernochet, and so these it was a verbal in, inversion. It was an inversion. My fault. Uh, this is from the CNRS in Villejuif, which is just outside of Paris. It's from Uni Université Paris Sud. It is from the Universidad Industrial de Santander, which is in Colombia, and it is from the um, Sorbonne in Paris. This is about syncytion, which is a, a protein that is required for development of the placenta. It is a fusogenic protein. It gives rise to the fused cell, cells that are part of the syncytiotrophoblasts, right? And we've, it talked is, about, we've talked about that phenomenon in the past in mammals. I'm sure. On Twitter. And it's in mammals, placental mammals. And the cool thing about this is that syncytions are genes that are derived from endogenous retroviruses. That's remarkable. It is the envelope gene of a retrovirus that infected many, many years ago, became endogenized, which means incorporated into the germ line. And then it was exapted, which is a lovely word, or refunctionalized as a protein required for formation of the placenta so these animals previously or, were laying, or repurposed repurposed probably the function is very similar yeah the, yeah the, because on the envelope of the uh, on the envelope of the retrovirus its function is to fuse the retroviral yes. membrane with the cellular membrane i'm using i i, I thought of refunctionalized because our elephant paper that we did on twivo last week was about refunctionalization of a viral gene of a gene so here um, it's it's repurposed and, you know, before they're laying eggs and now they're giving live births because they have a placenta provided by um, a retroviral infection, which is really a remarkable thing. And it's happened multiple times uh, in the evolution of various mammals. It's not frequent. It's, it's a bit rare, but it's happened more than once. Now, this paper is about lizards because some lizards happen to have placental structures, which I didn't know. I didn't know either. That was a total I surprise. Well, I, to I knew there were viviparous lizards, but I had never thought about how that worked. And I exactly. guess they can be placental. So these are South American and African syncyti lizards. So syncyti is the family. And there's a genus called Mabuya. These are better known as skinks. Skinks. Yeah. I love I had skinks. skinks when I Me was too. a kid. Me too. Cool. Me too. No, skinks are good. Five line skink. Plus, they have structures uh, very similar to those in mammals. They're a little bit different um, in the way they're made up. Um, in particular, in contrast to most mammals, the syncytial layer of the Mabuya placenta is made up of maternal epithelial cells rather than fetal. But 
the the idea is the same there. So they said, um, let's see if this this placenta came about as the result of a retroviral infection. <laughs> it turned out that no Mabuya genome <laughs> had yet been sequenced. And so uh, they couldn't simply go into the database and look for syncytion genes. Uh, so they um, went to uh, Columbia and captured some <laughs> pregnant female lizards. Yes, sir. I wanted to point <laughs> out that the reason why they were so so specific in telling you when the lizard emerged evolutionarily was this is after the meteor hit. And this is after the extinction of dinosaurs. Yeah. And it's claimed, of course, that one of the uh, saving graces of the mammals that happened to be left over from that event were survivors because they have placentas and they don't lay eggs and therefore they weren't exposed to the harsh environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They were burrowing rodents primarily. And so so maybe this – is this lizard a burrowing lizard? I do not know. Skinks? I don't, I don't know. know if they are. I don't think – well, uh, it's a diverse group and the Mabuya yeah. are a particular um, – genus i guess within the skinks so i wish right. someone might burrow so i i <laughs> i'm just curious as to whether or not there were egg layers that survived that impact 65 million years ago that could then evolve to give rise to well sure the the, the monotremes the egg laying mammals how old are they uh, they go back, um, well, I don't know Two, how long they've been. Between uh, almost 200 million years. Oh, yeah, wow. 200 million oh, years wow. or so. And well, placental development is right uh, kind of mid-Jurassic. Yeah. Do the eggs um, hatch yeah. apart from the mammal or do they hatch in a pouch? They hatch apart from the mammal. Uh, monotremes okay. are oviparous. No, they no, lay no, eggs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They, they, um, so a platypus lays an egg that has already started to develop an embryo inside it, and then sure. the egg hatches. And, uh, and that's been going on probably since before the, uh, before the impact. I was sitting at the dinner table last night, and I, I was alone, of course, because <laughs> I get home late. And there were people walking around, and I said, I, when did marsupials arise? And they look at me and go, why do you want to know that? <laughs> well, and the birds um, were laying eggs yeah, and they yeah, stuck yeah. around. So I don't think the placenta was a unique survival characteristic that allowed yeah, yeah. things to I mean, I've seen that. it written, but I, obviously there's a lot of evidence that uh, suggests that were many survival mechanisms, not just one. Right. So this is this is just just a little bit of an aside, but I had what I thought was maybe an insight this morning because I had not realized that uh, placental uh, uh, live birth involving a placenta had happened in other than uh, mammals, and I think it's somewhere in the paper they say that the one place where it's uh, entirely absent. Uh, is in birds. That's right. and I was trying to think right. about that, and I thought it also all of a sudden occurred to me that it might be tough to fly if you were pregnant. <laughs> well, <laughs> bats manage. Well, yeah, bats must do it. <laughs> That's bats true. Do do. Plus, uh, the pterodactyls you fly and carry you can fly and carry a pretty big egg. Are around there well. are there la are there birds that don't fly? Sure, yes, there are. Sure, so penguins. penguins. So, so they could get pregnant. The dodos and a whole bunch of rias. Ostrich. And ostrich. Yeah. Yeah. So they. They don't have to There's fly. A ton of them. But that's okay. an interesting thought. So that Rich. idea goes, but I thought it was great. <laughs> it's okay. It's a general biology group here, and let's get at all right. it. That's all right. All right. So they got they they got some pregnant uh, female lizards in Colombia, and they pulled out the the, the placenta at uh, embryonic development stage thirty five, which they say they have a well established syncytium, and they did um, a transcriptomic analysis. They take RNA out and <laughs> they sequence it, and they get lots of transcripts, and they and narrow them down, and then they, they want to know, are any of these transcripts uh, envelope-like? So um I love this sentence. In, in the introduction, they say, they, after capturing the, the females, they did RNA-seq. Um, remarkably, we identified such a gene, syncytion mm -hmm. mad body, which yeah. is like, holy crap, it actually worked. Yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they screened them for um, homology to envelope sequences, essentially, and they got four transcripts. Uh, which look like uh, envelope protein when they look at the sequence. They have the right features like signal peptide, cleavage sites, hydrophobic domains, anchoring domain, et cetera. And um, they can uh, put it on a phylogenetic tree and show that these are indeed uh, 
look like retroviral envelope proteins, but they're pretty distinct. They cluster what we, what we call gamma retrovirus type envelopes, but they could just as well be uh, a novel uh, set of viruses on their own, derived from a novel set of viruses. And they can also see in the genome, um, they, they went and looked at the, the, the genome of these, uh, and these lizards and could see the, the in, inserted retroviral uh, genomes from which these envelopes uh, derived. And interestingly, uh, they say that uh, the, the envelopes cluster with the envelope genes of Rouse sarcoma virus, thought to be a bird retrovirus, right? right. Yeah. So here we go. <laughs> you, you look and you expand uh, your sensibilities. Uh, the, the envelope is, this is called MAB on one through four. And uh, number one is highly exposed expressed in the placenta, so that's, of course, important to show that the RNA is expressed in the placenta. And uh, the others are, are less well ex, uh, expressed, the RNAs, so they, they spend the rest of the paper focusing on OMV1. Yeah, it's interesting to me mm. uh, that it's expressed in a bunch of other places as well, yeah, fairly, fairly uh, robustly, including, for example, brain. Hmm. Yes, and I, they do speculate on whether there's it's got a function elsewhere, right? Yeah, later on in the discussion, besides mm-hmm. in a function in the placenta. All right, so uh, this this number one envelope one is going to be the subject of the rest of the paper, and as they do look at the provirus, they, as I said before, they identify the provirus in the genome uh, that has given rise to this. Um, they they um, look at other species. Uh, excuse me for just a moment. The, yes, to course. me, the identification of the uh, provovirus that that really got me. Okay, because uh, that's important. You can, yeah. you can see that this that this gene that they've identified is in fact still sitting in the context of a, a dead provirus with a disrupted pole gene and everything yeah. else. So yeah. that yes. that to me is is really uh, very clear evidence that this has been. Uh, co-opted from a retrovirus it's sitting in the context of a retrovirus yes that's very important it shows that it got there from most likely by retroviral infection and not by any other means right right uh, they compare some other species and they find it um they, they they do they have to reduce their stringency of of pcr amplification but then they can find it in some related species as well um and they say that uh this means that the endogenization probably happened before the separation of all these genera, which is 30 million years ago. <laughs> I just love when, when you can say things <laughs> yeah. like that, right? Uh, they, they do some in situ analysis, so they make sections of the placenta, and they can look at RNA and protein uh, expression. And um, it, it is uh, where you would expect it to be if it's playing a role in production of the syncytia trophoblast. Um, they actually make anisera themselves to do that as well. And um, it, then the, the series of experiments, which I think are really cool, they say, is this protein fusogenic? Right? Can it fuse cells? And so they take the gene, the envelope, the MAB1, which has been captured from a retrovirus, and then they put it back into a retrovirus genome. Yeah. Right. They make a pseudotype Maloney murine leukemia virus with this a skink <laughs> syncytion gene, and it makes infectious particles. Yeah. I think that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. It yes. is cool. That, that Maloney is, a, is, is around today, right? That's what Steve Goff works on. Mm-hmm. And this thing is mm-hmm. millions of years old, and it's, it's, of course, its function has still been conserved, it's so it can fuse, and it can still work to make an infectious retrovirus. I think that's great. Yes. It's just lovely. Yeah. They tested it a bunch of against a, on a bunch of mammalian cells, so uh, human, bovine, uh, carnivorin, and rodent. And they said that the rodent cells always exhibited a lower yield of virus. Um, and what I wanted was for them to do this with the envelope three and four mm-hmm. in some avian cells. I thought that would have been cool. I mean, and when I I didn't mention it when you first said this. Uh, closeness in the phylogeny to the uh, Rouse sarcoma virus, but I immediately thought birds, reptiles make sense to me. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, they tried envelope two and that didn't work. 
Right. Or any of and they and it looks there. like a reviewer asked them because they also have a sentence envelope three and four were negative in uh, right. the two assays that they used. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they say because it infects so many different kinds of cells, and this is a reptilian envelope gene, uh, the receptor must be highly conserved among vertebrates. They also did cell cell fusion experiments. So they produce the protein in a cell and asks, will the cells fuse with each other? Uh, and they will when you reduce the pH. So it's a low pH mediated fusion. Um, and three and four were negative, in, as Kathy said, in both the infection experiments and also in the fusion. And notably, two, three, and four are not very well expressed yeah. either. Okay, so they're kind of, one is the, the hot one. Yeah. Uh, then they looked for the receptor. So this envelope protein, which is a membrane, plasma membrane protein, in order for it to um, fuse with a neighboring cell, you would have a receptor there. So they looked for that using a panel of human hamster hybrid cells in which basically pieces of the human genome are introduced into a panel of 93 cloned hamster cell lines. So little bits of human DNA are in there. And they just screened all of them for infection by the pseudotyped retrovirus. And they ask... Because the hamsters they had shown previously don't have the receptors. The humans do. Yeah, And they have... They give you the result, the infection results for the 93 clones. Yes. It looks almost binary, except there's yeah, a two zero, in there. Zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one, one. <laughs> Parens and lots and lots and lots. Of, so you know basically in each cell line how, what human DNA is in there. So then they can go to the sequence and say, uh, what is this? And they found a region, a two megabase region of the human genome on chromosome one, encoding 11 putative transmembrane proteins. And they tested mm. each of those. Uh, in their ability to mediate infection of cells, uh, and they they identified a gene called uh, myelin protein zero like one, MPZL one, previously characterized single pass transmembrane receptor. So that is the receptor for this um, MAB dash ENV one syncytion, which is cool. And they found the Mabuya MPZL one open reading frame that. Has sixty five percent amino acid similarity with the human one, and it acts, it also asks as a receptor, right? Because right. this screen was identifying the human receptor, and then they said, "Is there a lizard one?" And there is, and et cetera. And M- MPZL one is produced in the placenta of Mabuya's skinks, <laughs> yeah. and it's near where MAB env one is, so it could they could be interacting, right? It's close to that observed for envelope one, so they could in in theory in, in interact. Now MPZL1 is a signaling protein, and uh, this signaling involves phosphorylation of two tyrosines in the cytoplasmic domain. So they wanted to know whether envelope binding to MPZL1 could trigger phosphorylation, and indeed they found that it does. Um, so envelope binding to this receptor triggers its phosphorylation and also uh, triggers its degradation. So once the ligand binds to the receptor, the receptor is phosphorylated. Some signaling must go on. We don't know what that does at this point, but it could be interesting to sort out. And then the receptor is degraded. And, And so that is really the paper, but it has really interesting implications, right? So we have now a a non-mammalian species with a placenta where the placenta's development seems to depend on a captured retroviral envelope gene. And so the the timing on this, so the mammalian placenta uh, is believed to have emerged 150 million years ago. Right. Uh, And this one is 25 million years ago. And the, so they've got this, very handy phylogeny for because nobody remembers this stuff. At least I don't. Um, like what what diverged from what and when, um, and the the branch that the mammals are on diverged from the branch that the birds and lizards are on about three hundred million years ago. Mm-hmm. And then the birds diverged from the lizards about two hundred and seventy million years ago, um, and 
much, much later, the mammalian placenta shows up, maybe 150 million years ago. So the lizards are already in their own separate group, and they've put, uh, very conveniently, they put Mabuya and um, Anolis carolinensis, which is a, a green animal that's an egg-laying lizard mm-hmm. on this, and they diverged 200 million years ago. So they're, presumably Mabuya is going along laying eggs, and, and animals are going along laying eggs, and then one day, 30 million years, 35 million years ago, the Mabuya lineage manages to co-opt this, uh, to exapt this retroviral mechanism to make syncytia. And this allows them to make placentas and they become placental viviparous lizards. So what is Crazy. the, what is the earliest ancestor in the human lineage that would, uh, would be laying eggs? Do we eggs? Think? Yeah. Mm. Before, we, before placenta was acquired. So you'd have to go back to divergence from the monotremes, Mm-hmm. Which would have been a hundred and fifty some odd year million years, years ago. ago, right? <coughs> so if we didn't have a retro this retroviral infection, we'd be laying eggs, basically, right? Right. Some of us still do. So to me, it's uh, uh, mind boggling that this whole idea of a placenta and live birth has evolved on more than one occasion. Yeah. Yes, and. And especially mind-boggling that it seems to be that in uh, each case, it involves co-opting uh, an envelope protein from an yes. endogenous retrovirus. Yeah. And they, they, uh, they're careful about this, but they uh, make the argument that, in fact, the uh, uh, exaption of the endogenous retrovirus envelope protein is uh, essentially a prerequisite. Yeah. Uh, for uh, the uh, evolution of a uh, of a placenta. Yeah. So I have a question right. relating to sharks, because there are some sharks. Most sharks lay eggs, but some don't. Right. And the white shark does not. In fact, the white shark embryogenesis apparently, when they're fertilized, they're they're like eight or ten embryos that develop inside the mother shark, but she only gives birth to a single offspring, and so the um, question is what happened to the other seven and the answer is the uh, the one that emerges from the mother ate those seven sharks. wow it's like a shark tank in there it is yeah so i'm curious as to uh, whether or not there's some structure inside which allows that shark to survive that long during its own embryogenesis until they get to the point where they can eat and I don't know the answer mm-hmm. to that either, but I'm sure somebody's going to be looking that up like crazy right now. <laughs> I'm trying to find a viperous shark's placenta. I don't. Um, yeah, that's what I where I thought you were going with well, this. Well, I was wondering whether sharks. I was I was going to ask that next, of course, but they may they may be contained inside of an a yolk, you know, a, a, a membrane that surrounds the entire entity of the yolk and the in developing embryo. Yeah, uh, the information I'm getting is that they. They have a placenta. Ah. And. Is it a retrovirus protein? I would assume so. Bet. I would bet. Well, I wouldn't assume That's so. I would guess assumption. so. And <laughs> I would, guess and I would, it would, could be tested, right? Yeah. So if sharks have been around a that. long time. Oh, yeah. Back to the Devonian era. Well, right? they say here that the first placentas emerged in fish 400 million years Sh- ago. Okay, fish. So uh, hmm. what's the Lung name? fish, definitely. What's the name of the shark uh, genus? Squalus. Squalus? That's one of them. I don't know if it's on this chart here. I don't know the name of it. I don't the, see it. No. Interesting. No, they were, they were emphasizing the um, uh, land vertebrates. That's right. So, for, and they say that they make a comment here, which is really interesting. So, four hundred million years for fish, one hundred fifty million years ago for mammals, and twenty five million years ago for our skinks. This, uh, these emergences of the placenta have been random and rare. All right, so they've happened multiple times, but in, you know, in the overall scheme of things, it's not sure. a lot. It's pretty sure. rare. But they, I would say as as rich said probably all the placentas that we know of arose from retroviral infection so that begs the question of whether a placenta could arise without a retroviral infection <laughs> right i mean we do have fuso fusogenic proteins right. in us right 
And uh, yeah, it's so, really remarkable that they're all doing it this way. Yeah. So is right. it a matter of this was an easy way to do it, or yeah, I can just hear the genomic um, geniuses back there saying, "Why should we reinvent the wheel? We've already got one. Let's just put it to use again." <laughs> that, Come on. That's that's evolution. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, another thing is that uh, according to this, they discuss this, and and it's in the figure uh, with the phylogenetic tree. Uh, in several instances, the uh, there has been a new introduction of a new uh, envelope gene to do this during the evolution of the creature, if I understand this correctly. And in some, like in rodents, uh, three different events to recruit uh, new uh, syncytions from other uh, retroviruses. So it's mm-hmm. not as if you do this uh, once in the development of, of a placenta, you can say, oh, well, you know, we could do a little better than this. Yeah. How about this retrovirus over here? Yeah. You know? yep. Right. yep. Also, get it, getting back to Dixon's question, um, I think the sharks that you're talking about are not viviparous, they're ovoviviparous. Oh, right. Oh, they're eggs inside so, the hatch. Right, yeah, so yeah, they, yeah, the yeah, eggs yeah. are inside, yeah, that's right. they, oh, fe- they are feeding from a yolk, there's no placenta, that's right. That's right. Uh, an egg hatches, mm-hmm. it's still feeding from the yolk, it eats the other eggs. Got it. Uh, So I have a a kind of thought question. Now, since placentas emerge and live birth, obviously that's a survival. It it works, right? And those lots of animals around can can exist with placentas, right? But we also have animals who lay eggs, so they're both who have been very successful. They're both they both work, right? Right, they do. But uh, you wonder what does a placenta give you? What does live birth give you? Well, you you care for that individual. Usually it's an individual birth, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. But in mammals, it's usually two, three, at max Mm -hmm. four. I know that um, armadillos give birth to eight, but uh, I think otherwise it's Ah, mostly— So that's why humans can be born with a big brain, because they're born small and they can be cared for for a year until they can— They require a lot of care Uh compared to most animals. So so without— this placenta, humans wouldn't have evolved, probably. <laughs> or we would have had pouches out in front of us to keep the little baby until it gets older. Little joeys. And <laughs> yeah, maybe pouches, yeah. Because when they're born, they're almost microscopic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They so, have to be cared for. Cared so for. They don't have a very large placenta, is what I'm saying. I see. I see I think, it's a very I small think- placenta. An advantage of this is that you can, single give birth, births. you can give birth to much more fully developed um Young. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's of yeah. course, ovoviviparity also gives you that, where the eggs hatch and yeah. feed from a yolk inside the mother. But I, I would guess that you know, obviously there are going to be structural limits to how big an egg and how big a yolk you can put there, mm-hmm. and an advantage of having um, the direct maternal connection is that you can continue to feed the the developing embryo until it's really fully developed. And then give birth to something that, I mean, we think of the human example where it takes 20 years for the kid to move out of the house. But um, <laughs> if you if you look at, uh, uh, you know, giraffe or a horse or something, they give birth and the, the young stands up and they're right. off and grazing. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so the, that's a, obviously a tremendous advantage in an environment where the young are going to be targeted by predators immediately. Of course, their brains are smaller and. If they had a yeah. brain a big, as big as ours is in, in relationship to the body, they couldn't be born that way, ready to go. No. They'd have to be born smaller. So I, I think, you know, we have talked about other retroviral genes and sequences that have been exapted uh, in TWIV, but I think this one is really stunning that the way we are now really is dependent on retrovirus infections, <laughs> right? Yes. And if you didn't appreciate it before, I mean, you should have because we've talked about the mammalian ones, but it's pretty widespread. It may be everything, as they say, Yeah, with the placenta. It's really stunning. So, so I found a little article here that suggests, says that um, in cold environments, eggs can have a, a low survival rates because embryos are right. too cold to c- complete development. Hmm. Meanwhile, pregnant mothers can either produce their own body heat as in mammals or can bask in the sun to warm themselves as in reptiles, keeps embryos warm enough to grow. Pregnancy does offer one major disadvantage. Mothers are burdened with the cost of carrying around Correct. offspring for a Correct. long time. So it's like a parasitism in that sense. Hmm. Yes. That's right. So one more thing here that, you know, when I got into virology, we're, you're pretty much studying the virus on its own. You know, we each had a model system, one virus, you know, VSV or polio type one or whatever. But now 
we're integrating it into the biology of everything else on the planet like this. And I think that is where you really learn. Oh, Vincent, I think, you know, I, I would give yourself more credit than that. You had to learn a lot of cell biology along the way, too. Yeah, cell biology, so, but not animals. I mean, Not now the we're whole really, organism. The, the whole thing. I, I and not just that, but the ecology and, and yeah, evolution yeah, yeah, of it. And I think yeah, yeah. that is where right. you really appreciate what's gone on here, here sure. on this planet, right? Sure. And there must Actually, be tons could, of other examples here that we don't even know about. Yeah, of yet. course, of course. This could have been a Twivo paper. Uh, ah. Yeah. Could have been, yeah. Uh, but we just I'm did glad it was and, a Twivo paper, and, uh, though. Yeah, we had, yeah, I'm glad. We had I, a cool Twivo paper uh, two weeks ago. It was yes, uh, Kathy. What were you going to say? Well, that's what I was going to say, and I was on mute. So, um, oh. what, <laughs> what I was trying to say was that uh, as I finished reading this, I thought about what Vinnie Lynch said about his interest in the ecology or the evolution of life processes, yeah, and this yeah. totally fit within that. And yeah. so I was thinking, oh well, now Vincent needs to pick this. P- Twiv episode on his next Twivo. <laughs> yes, I will for sure. An image for just sure. popped into my head, I, and I, I, I have to apologize to the audience for for sharing my inner innermost uh, aberrant thoughts. You, oh, but, you've never done it before. Well, I've tried not to, <laughs> but in this case, I, I had a visual image of another way to connect things together, the way we just did, and it's called bio nodes. So here's a node where all kinds of convergent evolutionary processes come together to produce something completely different than you'd ever expect to happen as the result of that. Hmm. You don't, you can't guess what the whole looks like by looking at the parts. You have to wait for it to come together. And now you see, Oh my gosh, we can now do this and we can do this where we didn't know we could do that before. And that that's the way nature behaves. So nature is conducting basic science. You got it. Sure. You got it. And it's up to us to do, to pull it all apart and to make sense out of it. That's why when the, we had that gain of function argument, we said nature is really <laughs> Should the we better really go there engineer. <laughs> yes, uh, it's the right. people without a general background that fail to see that point, and that's where you got the opposition to that, and that's where their ignorance shone through. Kathy just posted a picture here. What is that, Kathy? Oh, that's the snow that's coming down oh, outside yeah, your we've globe. Got- Beautiful, well, just, beautiful. We could she, she emailed us a video as well, which is yeah. shows the nice. Uh, I'd effect. send you a picture of New Jersey, but we can't see it. <laughs> it's gone. It's white out. It's completely gone. Can you still smell it? Oh yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, are right. we going to summarize this paper, or how, are we moving on? <laughs> no, I think we summary. should summarize. Summary. <laughs> so, the way I see it, uh, the idea is that placenta. Structures aren't restricted to mammals, but they've been found in lizards, and in fact, they've been found in these skinks. And the authors looked for a uh, syncytion-type gene by looking for uh, sequences that would be like retroviral envelope sequences, and they found them. And then they showed that the one that they found could function in fusogenic activity and could function in a... Uh, in a virus-like uh, situation, as a uh, the word just went out of my head. Pseudotype. Um, pseudotype, thank you. And then uh, they, so that showed that it was functional. And then they found its receptor using a nice genetic approach. And the receptor is this MPZL1 gene that had been previously identified in signal transduction. And so the idea that the syncytion capture isn't just found in placental mammals, but also in some non-mammalian vertebrates is kind of the cool take-home message. And and the other thing is that uh, in the, the really broad sense, to make a placenta, you seem to start with a retroviral borrowing. And this has happened multiple independent times um, in evolution as far apart as lizards and mammals. When you said to make a placenta, that reminded me of those kid books, to make a cookie, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something if you give a lizard a placenta. If you, it takes there a while. You go. <laughs> that's your title, to, if you give a lizard a placenta. Yeah, that's very cool. All but right. a lot of other things have to happen, too. That's not just the retrovirus there. Yes. You can make a placenta, but if the embryos don't want to agree with that, then they're going to not survive. Oh, yes. so it's not just the simple. Things have got to be a evolved. bunch of yes. things all right. coming together. So I think that's it's necessary, required. but not sufficient, probably. So cool. the, the first thing is this gene has to come in, and then it starts to work with 
you know, what's there. <laughs> it reminds me of the argument that people leveled against the, uh, the theory of evolution by looking at the molecular motors in bacteria, saying that couldn't possibly have arisen through evolution. God had to do it. And then they presented all kinds of uh, pre-motor-like structures in bacteria that had other functions totally, until finally when they all came together, you got this thing that drove the, uh, drove the uh, flagellum. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's almost a, like a miracle happening at that point. It's nature, it's evolution. It is. It's, well, it's a miracle of nature. Okay, that's fine. (laughs) Let's do a few emails. Parthenogenesis has been called a miracle, right? Indeed. Our uh, first one's from Andrew Deer, Vincent, and the, all the TWIB team. I was just on a flight back from the Nanopore Sequencing Conference in New York City listening to the latest episode, TWIV 469. There were a number of issues that your listeners and TWIV stars have brought up during the last few episodes surrounding the challenges of landing new PI positions and the pressure to work excessive hours or land high-impact papers. I think I have a fairly unique perspective in that regard and feel compelled to write in. Currently, I'm an assistant professor in the Biochem and Molecular Biology Department, University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Just begun my third year. It has been a highly rewarding and challenging experience. I was previously a postdoc in Jack Johnson's lab, Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla. While Jack is renowned as a structural biologist solving the three-dimensional structure of many viruses and phages using electron microscopy and crystallography, I had carved out a small niche in his lab using next-generation sequencing to study how viruses package their genetic cargo. I always knew that I wanted to run my own laboratory, and so I had been eyeing up opportunities to run my own lab studying virus evolution and structure. However, during the er the time early September 14, 2014, that I was putting together my application materials to apply for faculty positions, one day I was forced to go to the ER with abdominal pain, which was quickly found to involve septic colitis. Within a day or so, I crashed going into septic shock, DIC, and organ failure. I spent over two weeks intubated in the ICU, though often conscious and able to interact with my care team and friends. It was only after a few days after an emergency. It was only a few days after an emergency colectomy. It merged that I had stage two colon cancer. That, I, that likely allowed the unknown infection to take grip. It took around 10 surgeries to successfully restore domain of my abdomen and install an end ileostomy. It is difficult to exaggerate the grimness and the trauma of this scenario that my wife Brittany and I now macabrely refer to as my spa treatment. <laughs> During this time, I received extraordinary care and concern, not just from my family and close friends, but from all my colleagues and lab mates at Scripps. My then PIs, Jack Johnson and Bruce Torbett, were often at my bedside comforting me, making sure I was receiving the best possible care. It was patently clear that I did not simply have a group of colleagues and coworkers, but a close-knit support network akin to a family. Due to the disorientation that is common among ICU patients, my friend and my now wife put together a collage of several drawings and pictures to adorn the walls of my hospital room. These images are encouraged by the nurses to conjure comfort and a sense of familiarity during distressed and confused wakeful periods. One of these images was a picture of an icosahedral particle of flockhouse virus. This provoked much amusement and interest among my doctors and nursing staff. I remember trying to communicate through scribblings in an iPad that I was a virologist and did next-generation sequencing and that I would love to sequence myself to see what I had. It wasn't until I was extubated that I was able to explain that flockhouse virus is a simple yet fascinating insect virus and that we use it as a model system to study the life cycle and molecular biology of other human pathogens. Despite all expectations, and thanks to wonderful and compassionate care from many nurses and doctors at the UCSD Thornton Hospital and support from my friends, colleagues, and family, I pulled through. Within a month, I was back at home writing new code, checking out new data sets, and binge-watching Downton Abbey. However, the challenges did not stop there. At stage 2, colorectal cancer carries about a 75 to 80% overall five-year survival rate. Despite this, it seemed natural to continue with the applications. There were many details of my application and background that might not have screamed PI. Specifically, while I believe my CV was strong, highlights were two PNAS, one JMB, and one NAR paper. I certainly had no high-impact CNS papers. Nor was I working on hot-button topics that might woo a headline-seeking search committee. I was not chasing Ebola, designing HIV vaccines, or determining the three-dimensional structure of CRISPR-Cas. Rather, I was proposing to study flockhouse virus as a model system in Drosophila cells to understand the mechanism of the evolution of defective interfering viral genomes. Nonetheless, I fielded a small number of applications and was delighted when I was asked to interview at UTMB in February, only four months after leaving hospital. I contacted the chair of the department, 
Mariano Garcia Blanco bumped in TWIV 458, and I told him about my health and that during my interview, I would be in the middle of adjuvant chemotherapy, albeit mild and with few visual manifestations. Faculty interviews often occur over multiple days, so I requested to have extra time after the interview to recover and rest before heading home. I still had an ostomy device at the time, and so I would also need extra time before long meetings or seminars, and traveling might not be easy. Initially, I was nervous about bringing this up. I asked him to keep this information private as I didn't want to make a needlessly dramatic first impression during meetings. Mentioning the cancer word can elicit a broad range of unpredictable responses. However, Mariano's response was highly compassionate, reassuring, and professional, which was strongly predictive of the supportive and kind chair that he has now become. So off I went to Galveston for the first time. The experience turned out to be excellent. Given my interest in molecular virology and using next-generation sequencing strategies to study virus evolution, it was clear that UTMB would be a highly fertile place in which to work and collaborate. Although I was studying model systems and had no CNS papers, I think my proposed research fit well within the desired path of the department. I instantly felt that this was a place I could work and thrive and a departmental community to which I would like to contribute. Admittedly, I didn't know the Institute well beforehand, and being a native Brit, I never imagined myself becoming a resident Texan. (laughs) Nevertheless, I'm delighted that I made the effort to seek out a new home in Galveston. In the last two years since starting my position, I've thought very carefully about how to manage my work-life balance. I really work the obscene hours, I think, has become the stereotype of superstar PIs and requirement for postdocs seeking that transition. Throughout my career and now, I aim to put in 40 to 50 hours a week. I often tell my students and postdocs that I do not expect them to work greater than 40-hour weeks, but there will certainly be times when you will need to the capacity to do so. I have had to be particularly sensitive to my own limitations physically and mentally to prevent burnout and to mediate diminishing returns in what is already a stressful career path. Due to the severity of my prolonged stay in ICU and, as is very common among cancer survivors receiving repeated CAT scans, MRIs, echoes, blood tests, etc., I found that I had to manage head-on the additional stress and anxiety of survivorship and the threat of recurrence. It is increasingly being recognized that prolonged ICU stays and cancer treatment can induce post-traumatic stress issues in survivors, and I do not feel that I'm any exception to this. I am now three years past my original diagnosis, but if I do not recognize when I am experiencing especially irrational anxiety, i.e. beyond that which might be expected of a looming grant deadline, for example, (laughs) and take the time to address this, the mental issues will never heal. Sometimes this simply means leaving work early, heading out for a jog, or persuading, well, corrupting a colleague to join me for a mid-afternoon beer. I'm fortunate in that I perform a lot of computational bioinformatics work that I can do practically anywhere. But I've always felt that one of the great advantages to our work as laboratory scientists is the possibility to work flexible hours, taking time off when needed and working hard at other times. I feel these mental health holidays are essential to me, and I feel grateful that my line of work is tolerant to them. I would encourage my colleagues and employees to do the same. not really sure there is any specific moral to my story. I find it difficult to describe or write about these experiences, and generally I don't discuss them. Indeed, the majority of my colleagues have no knowledge of my medical history. I don't think I have any specific advice for those seeking faculty positions based on my experiences, but when there is so much negativity and despondency surrounding the subject of becoming a PI, I am deeply concerned that there are those who who are presented with apparently insurmountable barriers and will be discouraged to apply. Given my own PI prospects and the effort involved in putting together applications, If I had not had the support and encouragement of my friends, colleagues, and mentors, I may quite easily not have tried. I think it's incumbent upon us as faculty members to reduce barriers and to encourage upcoming young scientists seeking a long-term home to find fitting opportunities. I'm not sure the best way to do this, but I hope that by sharing my experience, I may encourage someone else to make that plunge. I was fortunate in that my proposed ideas fell on fertile ground, but you miss 100% of the shots you do not take. I would be delighted if my experiences and positive outcomes could influence some TWIV listeners and encourage them to seek out their dream jobs. The temperature is a mild 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21C with 94% humidity. It's overcast yet bright and still, just like a summer's day back in the UK. Many thanks for all that you do. I have been a listener on and off for years and greatly appreciate the discussions. I find it very helpful in keeping up with the latest zeitgeist excitements and controversies in our field. 
Apologies for the long letter. I tried to keep it concise while covering all the critical points. Please feel free to contact me if you have any other questions or share my experiences, if they help. With kind regards, Andrew. That's great. Yeah, it's great a really letter. nice letter. Great letter. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, uh, both Jack Johnson and uh, Mariano Garcia Blanco are just fabulous people and fabulous mentors. Uh, so good, good mentoring and uh, compassionate uh, mentoring and friendship uh, is important in this whole process. Um, and I also, it occurred to me after finishing this that uh, he writes really well and really explains himself well, and that's important for getting a job. <laughs> Yes. I should say that uh, we had a faculty member hired here in the 80s, Richard Parker, and he was hired right. knowing that he had uh, lymphoblastic T cell lymphoma. Right. He had a bone marrow transplant. He'd had two, I think. And we hired him, and he, he lasted a few years. He died, unfortunately, but mm -hmm. we never thought twice about not hiring him because of that. Mm. Yeah. So it's important. Um, to give people a chance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's. I like his line. Uh, you miss a hundred percent of the yeah, shots you don't take. That's yeah. great. Yeah. I love it. Yep. Sure do. All right, let's do a couple more. Alan, can you take the next one? Wait a minute. I haven't read one yet. Well, you might get to read one. I haven't read any yet. All right, you want to do the that. next one? I do because okay. it's short. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Twenty Hogwe writes. No, no. The twenty is. From the, book, from the book contest. You don't have to read the number. Do it again. <laughs> hello, Twiv. Prof I thought, okay, Alan, take it. Um, hello, Twiv professors. I was introduced to Twiv last December by my son who was working on his PhD at Duke University. I love your podcast and have not missed a single episode since then. I thoroughly enjoy every episode, especially love the way you discuss scientific papers. You have the talent to make the complicated paper so easy to understand. I am a self-taught virologist and start using plaque assays in my experiments. When I was having problems with the plaque assay back in March, Twiv came up with the rescue. <clears throat> came to the rescue. In the episode 435, you talked about what could inhibit plaque formation, which helped me figure out what my problem was very quickly. I'm a big fan and a happy patron of TWIV. Wow. I'm looking forward to every new episode of TWIV and TWIV family of other podcasts. Uh, the main reason for me to write is that I want to put my name in the hat to win the viruses book. The weather in Sacramento, California is sunny, a sunny 16 degrees C. All the best. Period. Why do you say period? There's a name there. It's a Togwe. <laughs> okay. Hong, Hongwe. 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 And by Hongwe. the way, that episode, we geeked out on plaque assays. We did. And see, it helped. It helped people. <laughs> oh, the, that's why we did it. Come on. Well, some people complained that it was too really? geeky, but you oh. know how we are with complaints. I do. You know how we are with plaque assays. <laughs> <laughs> Both Alan, are art. I just don't want to placate the audience. Right. All. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Uh, Madalena writes, Hi, Twiv team. I'm writing to you all the way from Higelicht, <laughs> Denmark, having just uh, having just got home from the lab after a chilly bike ride in zero degrees wow. Celsius. I always listen to Twiv on my daily bike commute. I just realized that in Danish time, I have exactly two hours left until the deadline for the virus book competition. So here goes nothing. I also wanted to mention how exciting it was as a second year PhD student studying abroad in Denmark, I'm originally from England but born in Romania, to have my first paper that I have collaborated on mentioned on TWIV a few months ago, TWIV 456, Be Careful of Canons. As a TWIV listener and PhD student, this was extremely exciting. My PhD project is centered around studying patients with extreme varicella zoster virus infection and trying to understand the potential genetic component behind this. You continually inspire me throughout the ups and downs of Ph.D. life. <laughs> and as a fairly naive student at the beginning of my Ph.D., I particularly enjoy listening to your debates on highly relevant topics such as open access and research funding. Keep up the good work. And as they say in Denmark, Tusin Tak, literally translated as a thousand thanks. Tusin Tak. Nice. I like it. And what, Kathy what? has helpfully translated Higelig does cozy. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Nice. Chilly. So co cozy Denmark. It is a cozy country. I, I like being there. 
It was good. Thank you, Madalena. Mm. Yes. She's a, a European traveler, it seems. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Very Kathy, nice to see. You take the next one. Sure. Justin writes, hello, Twivers. Put me in the raffle for the book. I would love a coffee. <laughs> Copy. You mentioned in episode 468 that you were looking for something cool to do in Austin. I don't know how you could integrate this into a TWIV episode, but I have recently discovered a very active caving community in Texas. There are a hundred caves of various sizes in and around the city of Austin. Wow. It might be neat to record a TWIV in a deep cavern under Austin <laughs> if all the hosts are feeling somewhat adventurous. At any rate, it is certainly worth checking out if you are into that sort of thing. The weather in College Station is at a sunny 23C, 74 Fahrenheit. Have fun in Texas, Justin. Boy, would that if be we, an acoustic nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Alan, and, you and, would rule. You would absolutely <laughs> rule in that cave. I want to hear this. <laughs> and, and also, Peter Palazzi would warn us about going into caves where there might be bats. Yes. Right. Well, there, there's a Inhalation famous colony rabies. of bats in Austin, right? Yeah, yes. they live under the Congress Street Bridge. That we ought to, uh, I don't know if it'll be the season, I think so, but that's an event. People go out to uh, hang out at the bridge and watch the bats come out. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hang out at the bridge, Rich. I mean, it would be dark in this cave, so we'd need to have lights, and that means we'd exactly. need a generator outside the cave. Oh, uh, the yeah. logistics are different. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very different. And then since we've lost our sponsorships, we can't pay for it. So <laughs> I'd say, I'm sorry, but it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, spelunking. All right, Rich, one more. Scott writes, Dear Twiv Ninjas, it is with a terrible heaviness of heart that I have come to the end of binge listening just today to episodes one through four, six, nine. Wow. Over the past Good. four no months at one and a half speed, and now must adjust myself to only <laughs> a weekly fix. I've started on TWIP, so that will be some consolation. <laughs> I'm writing to request that you, quote, randomly, unquote, pick me to okay. win the virus book contest from episode 468, as I'm always looking for a good read outside my comfort zone in my limited free time, which is why I picked up Principles of Virology, as well as multiple other books that you all have picked over past episodes. Hmm. That's uh, there are uh, there are three sentences there. Okay, uh, first off, uh, so he's got a, a numbered list here. First off, um, here in northern Kentucky, exactly seven point five miles from CVG on a heading of one eighty. At Cincinnati, uh, Northern Kentucky International Airport. Okay. Nice. At uh, nice. 52, uh, 52Z, it is a misty 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5.3 deg six degrees Canadian. Winds <laughs> are from 310 at 8, visibility 10, skies clear, temp 6, 2.3, altimeter 30.16. Sounds like a pilot, eh, Alan? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Two. If you see the airport, you can land now. <laughs> Two. Happy birthday, Kathy. Three. Nice. My greatest contribution to science so far is my daughter, Hannah, who is in her third year of a fully funded MD, PhD at UIC. Uh, what's that? University of Illinois. Chicago. Chicago. Oh, right. Chicago. right. Right, 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 right. Uh, we're watching for great things from her in pediatric oncology research. Mm. We're also keeping a keen eye on the pending tax bill mm. with mm. the greatest interest due to the possible tax consequences for her. <laughs> dear, dear. Four, Vincent had mentioned bourbon in a few recent episodes. If you are ever in um, northern Kentucky – uh, with time on your hands, I would love to take you on a tour <laughs> of any of Kentucky's amazing distilleries, especially uh, Bleat. Is that how you pronounce that? Bleat, yeah. Uh, and our beautiful horse country. That's my favorite bourbon, by the way. Four, more importantly, if any of you would consider presenting or even just meeting briefly to inspire middle school science students at my wife's school during a layover at or near <laughs> CVG, I would happily facilitate any logistics. Six, transcribing of the episodes had been mentioned in the early TWIV series, series, but not so much recently. If it is still of interest to you, I would be happy to volunteer to start working on that if you feel that could still be helpful. Seven, my suggestion for a pick of the week uh, gives a website summary from the site. The Sagan series is a collection of tribute vi videos dedicated to the late, great Carl Sagan. My parents, 
purchased the Cosmo, the Cosmos hardback for me when the series was first airing, and I read that book to death. Leonard Nimoy's In Search Of was a close sec- a second. Where are the shows of that nature today amidst the Shark Week pablum <laughs> the Science <laughs> Channel spews? Eight, Vincent, please be nice to Dixon. He is. In closing, <laughs> if I ever get the opportunity to meet you in person, please don't be a, uh, offended <laughs> if I speak at one and a half speed so you can tell who is so I can tell who is who. <laughs> Thanks. He said Scott. if he asks us uh, to speak uh, at uh, one and a half. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> All right. It's nice. Very nice. Excellent. Great. Well, nice if you one. want to do Thanks. some transcripts, I'll be in touch, Scott. Uh, I find it useful because a transcript is searchable. Yeah. Right. And and voice is not yet so. That's why I like it because people, all of our content doesn't come up in any Google search, right? Because it's not searchable yet. So that would be great. I I worked out a little hack with YouTube. They um they do transcripts of videos because they want your yeah. video content to be searchable. Yeah. And there is a way to upload to YouTube. Uh, leave it sitting there for a little while. It will automatically produce a transcript. You can then download the transcript. And then do a few search and replace commands and get a a usable transcript of something. I don't know if you could get away doing this with, say, the whole TWIV library because somebody might flag it uh, somehow. I'm not sure. Well, it, it's unique content. It shouldn't be. It well, yeah. it is. It is unique content. I'm just wondering um, if uh, if Google would object to this use of their service. Well, if you leave the video, uh, what a lot of people do with podcasts is they'll. Post it on YouTube with just a, a picture for the whole episode, right? So it's right. a video, but with a static oh, picture, yeah. okay. and the and the audio is there. And, and my kids listen to <laughs> that stuff all the time, and there's no video, so you could do that and get the transcript. So Scott, if you want to try that, you can you can do that. Yeah, it seems like the laborious part for that would then be doing the the post conversion yeah. editing, yeah. but right. at but least I, you I don't have to get it down in in the first place. That would save yeah, you a bunch I, of effort. I found a series of regular expressions that I could use to replace all the cruft that goes with the transcript um, mm. and and generates the the problem would be it wouldn't say who's who. Um, yeah. Right, right, right. So it, it would certainly be better to have I mean if somebody's volunteering to do a transcript yeah. that That'd be great. There are there are machine driven transcription services now, which yeah. are getting better, but they don't say who's saying what. That's right. I think a big part of it. But if, if of course if you just want to index a conversation, it doesn't matter who's saying what. And uh, so basically, no one would read it, but it, they would find some phrase on a search and right. use it. Right. <laughs> Everyone in, on, on this show would take offense if you got confused for me. However, so I think that's <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> You should be nice to me. <laughs> I'm being nice to myself at this point and saying that. I- Let's do some picks, okay, Dixon? Sure. Do you have a pick? I do, actually. The pick I have is the extended list winners for the National Geographic F- Nature Photographer of the Year contest. And again, I'm a visual they're, kind they're of. They're missing somebody here. Yeah, they are me. <laughs> so I entered this contest with fully aware of the fact that there there isn't a chance in hell that I could even get an honorable mention. I just wanted to see how I compared to the rest of everybody out there taking photographs of natural phenomena. And the winners are spectacular. Mm. The the yeah. winner overall is a waist-deep orangutan looking so suspiciously around to see if anything is bad happening so that they can proceed through this swamp. I imagine somewhere in the deepest jungles of Borneo, but... Um, it's the expression on the face of this primate is just absolutely precious. Um, all of the winners are highly uh, deserving of their awards. I mean, to be in the right place at the right moment with the right camera, with the right settings, with the, you know, all these things, they all have to come together at the same time and, uh, sort of like a placenta occurring inside of a, a lizard. Um, and it was an honor and a pleasure to be part of it, but I can, I can say that, uh, you know, it's a humbling experience to see, you know, you think, oh, I've got a great photograph. I'll just put this one up and then I'll just put this one up. And by the time you do this and now you're surveying everybody else's and it's, oh, geez, I shouldn't have done that. You know, you can take them back, but I didn't, of course. And I just had these a, are spectacular. I had a great. These time. are amazing. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, they're extensive, too. And so they'll keep you busy for a while to check them out. But yeah, I had such a wonderful time from the beginning of this contest to the very end to just 
get to see who's out there and how many people. And they had, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand entries or something like this. It, at, by the way, at fifteen dollars an entry, so they must have done pretty well with this. <laughs> yeah. One thing I want to point out is that the captions are over on the right hand side. Yeah, uh, yeah I was looking right. through that's them right. at first that's and right. didn't see the captions. Yes. So I think that's good to know. Not only that, you can get the settings on the camera that the picture was taken at. So that's really important. Gee, you see what the lighting is like. That's called that. metadata. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. You can download them for your desktop, your tablet, yeah, 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 your phone. Yeah. It's wallpaper. That's yeah, like, that's like right. this, this hawk stealing got, a piece of a, of a beehive. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't that? care about being see stung, that? does he? <laughs> but notice that everything in the picture is in focus. Jeez. I mean, that's an incredible shot, right? Yeah. I think the I like, one, the I like the owl hunting rodents. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I like this lenticular cloud over the lighthouse at, with the rainbow. It. That's fabulous. That's, did you notice that's the fabulous. wasp and the paralyzed caterpillar? Yeah, I did, of course. Which, of course, we've talked about yeah, yeah, lots. Sure. There's a virus in there. There is. There is. <laughs> it's great. No, this is good stuff. Cool, good. Dixon. Really good stuff. Very nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're going to enter next year, Dixon? Of course. Absolutely. No question about Speaking it. Speaking of entering, I forgot to say, we still have not heard from the winner of the book contest. So huh. we'll mm -hmm. give it a few more weeks. And we'll pick another one. We'll re-randomize. <laughs> Alan, what do you have? I have something I was surprised hadn't been picked yet, and uh, it's <laughs> the holiday season coming up, so let's just have some cuteness here. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't already seen this site, you really ought to check it out. And if you have seen it, you ought to check it out again anyway. It's <laughs> Zooborns. Mm. Um, this is a blog of, of newborn animals at zoos around <laughs> the world, and they'll... <laughs> They'll post a bunch of pictures of the cute little babies, uh, or sometimes not so cute little babies. Uh, but then they'll they'll have some information on uh, these animals and their biology and their their current status. And um, a lot of them, of course, of course, are endangered. And these sure. represent major victories in conserving them. Uh, but it's also oh, yeah. just darn cute. Mm, very <laughs> nice, Rich. What do you have? Uh, this is from my grandchildren. <laughs> this uh, is good. It's the Raging Idiots Planet Song. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's on YouTube. I won't play it right now. But uh, uh, it's anything that can get a five-year-old kid jumping up and down and screaming about the solar system is worth it. <laughs> okay? And it, uh, it's a song built around uh, a mnemonic device. I guess that's what you'd call it for remembering the order of planets. Uh, my very energetic mother just uh, served us nine a, pizzas. Served us nine pizzas. <laughs> okay, and they got a song to go around this. Right. So, right, have, have a look. Haven't we had raging idiots before here on Twitter? I don't know. They've got Are you, you know. Kidding? They've got. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Way did, to go, Alan. Way to go. <laughs> I didn't say it. I didn't say it. No, we all agreed. All right, <laughs> Kathy. What do you have? Well, I have a uh, Google Doodle. The one that really got me started on this was the one the other day that was um, uh, Jan Ingenhaus's 287th birthday. But uh, he's a, a Dutch physician who basically discovered photosynthesis. And so that was the Google Doodle that day. And then uh, to, to refine it and get a better link to it. I just went to the Google site and, of course, Googled Google Doodle. <laughs> and uh, so I put that link in as well. And I hadn't noticed it, but uh, earlier in December – or no, a after the photosynthesis guy, they did uh, Robert Koch on mm. December 10th. Mm. So mm. Uh, that was – that was on Sunday, so that explains why I didn't see Google because I don't think I was on the internet that day. So, mm. uh, but they show where the Google, re, uh, you know, where they use that Google over on the in a global map and uh, this day in history Googles and so it's just it, it was really fun. But I liked seeing these two scientists in close succession. Coke one is really nice. It is. Mm -hmm. I love it. The little thing of him in the cylinder. The what, potatoes. Mm -hmm. the Those are potatoes. Dish, yeah. 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 Nice. I didn't realize you could click and go and get some more detail on each mm -hmm. one. That's cool. Very nice. All right. Dixon just left. Oh, okay. But he'll be back. Uh, my pick is um, a. Uh, so at last uh, on Twivo, I had. Was it Twivo? No, it was on Immune. I had a pick on this website called Colossal, which is about arts and crafts. And um, I found this one, which is. <laughs> Sculptor, Japanese artist Yuki Tsunoda uh, makes um, 
insects, flowers, and other types of plants at almost scale size out of glass. She uses uh-huh. she molds tiny bits of soft glass called Moretti glass with small tools, and she makes them. And they're just so nice. There's a dragonfly, there are ants, leaf cutter ants, and other things that are just beautiful and delicate, mm, and uh, they are. look really cool. Praying mantis. Yeah. They are beautiful. Yeah, so they're cool. Neat. Good to look and at. They're and supposed to be actual size? She said they're almost uh, actual size, yeah. Wow. So, there's sm- yeah. so some of them are very small, yeah. Yeah. This is a really neat site. There's a lot of cool stuff. If you look at the bottom under the article, you'll see kind of related things, um, a lot of glass stuff and, and other things as well. So check that out. That's pretty cool. Uh, we had a listener pick from Scott. We have more. We have one from Paul who sends in um, Saturday morning breakfast cereal comics. Uh, Do you think viruses are truly alive? Nah, they're just barely getting by, huh? (laughs) And then we switch to the couch. Too tired to write my novel, too awake to go to sleep. (laughs) Virus particles sitting on the couch is great. So, um, you know, Paul knows what we like here on Twiv. And then Trudy writes, this came in yesterday. Could I squeeze this in as a pick? The week before Christmas, if scientists wrote Christmas songs, so funny. And the part about Celsius made me laugh out loud. It's a YouTube <laughs> video. Um, and she said, speaking of Celsius and snow, I'm not sure if you guys heard about this, but we got a serious snowfall last Friday. Here's a picture of my daughter building a snowman in our backyard last weekend. And this is in Georgia. Yeah, this is substantial <laughs> uh, yes. snow for Georgia. Is that, yeah, I was going to ask yeah. you. you yeah. Know, do you don't? usually get it looks like a couple of inches right yeah it's a couple inches and she said in uh northwest georgia they got like eight inches wow Wow. yeah it's pretty amazing so is it like once a year you get this it's an average of one snowfall a year at least in athens Mm. so um the other thing about this video is that it uh really good acapella singers and they do a (laughs) medley of songs and uh one of them tells you that uh the other reindeer were probably misnamed. So it's worth checking out. Okay. <laughs> Happy almost Twiv Day. So Trudy is a true fan. She knows Thursday is almost Twiv Day. Mm. Love it. It's Twiv 472. Microbe.tv slash Twiv Apple Podcasts. Any podcast player, whether it's on your phone or tablet, computer, you can search for Twiv and subscribe. Please do. And you get every episode. Send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. And please support us, microbe.tv slash contribute. And all of those who have supported us, thank you very much. We are grateful. We think of you always in every waking. Well, not quite. We do. But we're very grateful. We're eternally grateful. Dixon de Pommier can be found at National Geographic. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah, your your wishes, pictures are there. He wishes. Aren't your pictures there? Yeah, they're there someplace. Buried but in that buried website. Buried in the archives, that's right. Uh, Parasiteswithoutborders.com and thelivingriver.org. Two superb sites. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. It was a, really a lot of fun today. More so than ever? No, not more so. I had a lot of fun today. You always have fun. I do. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is a emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. And Alan Dove can be found at turbidplaque.com and also on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws or on Twitter or Instagram as P-R-O-F-V-R-R. Dixon, Instagram.com. If you like pictures, and I always show you these fish or these pictures. whales, that's Instagram. Love, it's really cool. Love pictures. I'll, I'll make it a pic sometime. But I follow all these <laughs> these people who post whaling videos, not whaling, but whale yeah. picture taking yeah. videos, yeah. and it's just amazing to see these big humpbacks coming out of the water. Oh man! It's and then you asked me whales. what they were doing. I wanted and, to know why they. Jumped and what out did of the I water. tell you? What did I tell uh, you? They, you said the best jumper gets the female. No, they're they're trying to scare off other males. Yeah, they scare off other males, and, right. and then they get to be the alpha male, right? Exactly. I thought they were just playing. They don't, they don't butt heads like <laughs> they. You they know, were playing. <laughs> they're not oh, well. playing. That's not play for them. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of Twiv and Ronald Jenkins for the introductory music. RonaldJenkins.com. You've been listening to this week in virology. 
Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>